In this video, we will be revisiting the Triton Montenegro High Roll series, but this time we will be reviewing a couple hands played by online cash game crusher Timothy Kuznetsov, better known by his online handle, True Teller. The first hand is relatively early on in the 110k Euro main event and is between True Teller and Jesus Cortez from Spain. Cortez opens in the hijack with King Jack of Clubs, 2.25x the big blind, and True Teller calls on the button with Ace 4 of Clubs, both of which are relatively standard plays. The flop comes 3 9 6 with two clubs, giving True Teller the nut flush draw and Cortez the second nut flush draw, and Cortez checks. As we can see, in Cortez's shoes, the solver is splitting its frequencies with its entire range, which will oftentimes mean that the EVs between betting and checking will be close. And we can use Pio's EV comparison feature to confirm this. As we can see, most of the range is white, meaning the difference in EV between betting half pot and checking is zero or negligible. Note that there are a few exceptions, such as these marginal hands which are leaning towards checking, including deuces, gut shots, and high card with backdoor straight potential. However, we see that the max EV loss, if we bet half pot instead of checked, is around 170 chips, which translates to less than half a big blind. So, in an effort to simplify the game, this could be a spot where we choose a 100% bet or check strategy with the entire range. Alternatively, on these types of neutral EV boards, you could decide to bet or check based on exploitative factors or a randomizer, which should keep you closer to the balanced GTO frequencies in the long run. As for why PO is mixing its strategy on this board, my guess is that it is primarily a function of two competing factors. The preflop raiser's slight range advantage, conflicting with the preflop raiser's positional disadvantage. On the one hand, although we can see that the hijack and button are close in terms of percentages of sets and top pairs, the preflop raiser will have significant advantage when it comes to over pairs since its range is uncapped. On the other hand, the fact that Cortez is out of position should significantly devalue his range since he will be acting first with less information, thus making it harder to realize his equity. And as we can see, while the hijack has a slight equity advantage, it is at a slight EV disadvantage. And we can get a more concrete and objective sense of the value of position by running a few experiments. This screen shows three sims. The sim on the left is based on the current hand, with Cortez out of position. In the middle, all of the variables are the same as the current hand, such as SPR, the board, and betting strategies, except one. The positions of the players have been switched, so True Teller's calling range is now out of position, and Cortez's raising range is in position. As you can see, having the exact same range but being in position increases betting frequency and EV significantly. And in the third sim on the right, we have given both the in-position and out-of-position players the exact same range. Despite neither player having a range advantage, we see that for the out-of-position player, the percentage of checking increases significantly, and the average EV decreases significantly compared to the control hand which I think really crystallizes the value of position from a GTO perspective. You, you're in a three bet pot, you flop top pair, turn trips, and you only lose two small streets of value. True Teller bets around 36% of the pot. We see here that PO is using a mixed strategy between betting third pot and checking. Although the button will have a number of whiffs on this board, such as Broadway overcards, for the reasons mentioned previously, Cortez should have checked a decent portion of his stronger holdings out of position on this board, which means True Teller needs to proceed with some caution and not bet his entire range. That being said, the nut flush draw is a fine candidate to take a stab at the pot with. And by the way, if you're playing in a game like that regularly, pick a different game. <laughs> and a full deck, you just see it in, in board. True Teller bets 10,000 with his ace four of clubs. He's got the nut flush draw, of course, some backdoor straight possibilities, as well as just ace high, which is the best hand right now. Cortez calls, and we see that Pio is mixing its play with this holding. You're obviously not folding here, but calling or raising are equal in EV, which will oftentimes be the case with flush draws. And the deuce on the turn does put additional draws out there for Kuznetsov, he's got a wheel draw. The turn brings a two of hearts, giving True Teller a gut shot to go along with his flush draw, and Cortez checks, 
which is consistent with the solver strategy as the offsuit deuce should not interact much with the preflop raiser's range. Limp pot, people are checking some, yeah, okay, he still needs to, you know, be in control of everything. Yeah, just six okay. outs here for Cortez. This would be a pretty, pretty ugly beat. That's impressive. If you're as cool that's off, you end up losing this one. It's hard to convince yourself to put so much effort for such a tiny extra volume. Yeah. True Teller bets 73% of pot, and on this card, we see that Pio also begins applying max pressure, doing some checking but primarily utilizing a full pot size bed. It appears that this card is starting to skew the board in the cold caller's favor, whose range should be largely concentrated around pocket pairs and suited connectors, including 5 4, which makes a straight. True Teller utilizes a slightly smaller sizing with his combo draw, but we see here that the EV difference between his bet and the recommended full pot bet is negligible. Maybe sometimes you get some idea or something. All that said, by the way, I, I agree with you in the sense that the vast majority of, you know, recreational players are just calling. I'm man. just calling, but for probably for the wrong reasons, for like an oversimplified reason that we're scared will, of will lose me more money. In the yeah. Run. yeah. Hmm? Or not gain me as much money, I should say. Ooh. Cortez moves all in. And Cortez decides that playing against True Teller is no longer fun and decides to jam all in more than 2x the pot. As you can see, Pew is not doing much check raising here, let alone check shoving. Really, the only value hands Pew is taking this line with are a small percentage of combos consisting of queens, jacks, tens, and top pair, top kicker, likely for protection. Right, we see that most aces and some kings are not even raising here. And we see that Pio is also less inclined to raise with holdings that contain a club as they block flush draws. Additionally, holding two aces or kings heavily block many of the bluffs in True Teller's range, and when those two cards are removed, the remainder of his compressed range will consist of a significant percentage of sets and straights that have pocket pairs crushed. That's Cortez uh, figured out the one way maybe he can win the hand. Can bit of an over off the fold. How many more levels? Decent one more. more. One and a half hours. Like, how do you put your opponent on worse clubs? Well, yeah. Your opponent could have a set right now. <laughs> you could have an over pair. You could have two tens, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if Kuznetsov thinks that his ace is good, he knows the five is good, he knows the club is good. not getting a particularly good price as he's got to call about 185,000 to win 293 so he's not getting a good price he's going to use these time chips four five by the way also got there Cortez happened to have that hand Cortez really making playing out of position work for him here. Pretty rare. And he gets the fold. Cortez found the one way he could win the hand. Yeah. So True Teller folds, mucking the best hand. And we see that Pio is mostly folding here as well. Yes, True Teller had a number of outs, but his odds of hitting a flush or straight or even an ace do not justify calling this massive overbet with one card to come. The only draw that is mostly calling here without showdown value is 8 7 of clubs, which is a straight flush draw, giving him 8 additional outs, and taking into account potential pair outs in case of a bluff makes calling a roughly break even play. And now on to the second hand, which is a bit later in the main event, but still on day one, this time between True Teller and Daniel Dvoris. So Dvoris opens under the gun with kings, 2x the big blind, and True Teller calls in the button with deuces. So again, True Teller is cold calling here, which he should be doing quite a bit of with the ante. And we can see how the ante should affect his calling range by comparing it to the calling range for a cash game without an ante. This shows the GTO strategies of the button facing a middle position open with similar stacks and raise sizes. 
The anti game is on the left and the no anti game is on the right. As you can see, with the anti, approximately 10% more of the range is defending compared to the no anti game. But interestingly, most of that additional defense percentage is being allocated to calling instead of 3 betting. And I think this makes sense at this stack depth, since with the ante, you want to see more flops, but at the same time, you will generally have less fold equity since your opponents will also have a greater incentive to call. And a similar <laughs> suck out. Do we think, is, wait, is True Teller going to be standing up in about 40 seconds doing a dance? I'm going to take the under on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I small bet on a flop and then he calls. What is happening? Let's just call it. Let's just call it a day here before more damage can be done. Deucey, never Lucy. It is set heaven here at Triton Poker. It is a bad day to start with the best hand. And this is a pretty wet board. Be interesting to see how this gets played out. Flop comes 8, 10, deuce with two clubs, and divorce bets around 68% pot. And we see that Pio's C betting strategy here is somewhat similar to the last hand, where most of the range is splitting frequencies between betting and checking. However, the solver is doing a bit more betting here and with a smaller amount. I'm guessing this is because the higher flop skews in favor of Divorce's stronger under the gun range relative to the 9 6 3 board and Cortez's hijack range in the last hand. At the same time, this board is slightly less connected, thus resulting in fewer strong draws in the button's range, which could call a larger bet. I did hear tournament director Luca Vivaldi announce that after that hand, there would be three additional hands, and that'll be it for the night. Daniel will thank him for that. <laughs> this might be it for the night for him anyway. Deuces never loses. Because that's off. True teller. Deciding how he wants to play this hand on the button. Is this an actual thinking time? I mean, I guess he's got time banks to use if it's the last three hands of the night. My gut tells me he already knows what he wants to do, but he's just taking time to do it. Raise the 66,000. So True Teller decides to raise 3 xing Divorce's bed. Pio is mostly calling here, I think largely because of the sizing and also due to being in position. Obviously, betting larger should, in most circumstances, lower the raising frequency of your opponent. As we can see, if Divorce had c-bet smaller, the button begins raising with higher frequency, including with bottom set. Also, this larger sizing is beginning to polarize. Many of Divorce's stronger holdings will have the button's range crushed, including higher sets, over pairs, and top pairs. And with the bluffing hands near the bottom of Daniel's range, I think Pio is happy to call and allow the out-of-position player to continue to barrel to build the pot. So in either case, whether this is a value bet or a bluff, raising isn't the preference when considering overall ranges. However, we see that raising bottom set here is virtually identical in EV to calling, so this play by True Teller is generally okay from a GTO perspective. What do you think of it? Tough spot for Dvoris. He does not have a king in the, uh, a king of spades in his hand. It's a wet board. I mean, it's an easy spot for him, but it's going to be tough once the cards are on their backs. Right. Well, he knows when he's getting raised here. He, his opponent's going to have some sets, possibly two pair, and a whole bunch of bluffs. The uh, what I've noticed is. Like, when I have it, I don't mind it. And then someone told me sometime to try it next to Heineken. I don't even love Heineken. Ah, yeah, that but, and then I, no, then I was like, oh, no, wait. <laughs> oh, really? I don't mind it. 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 I don't there's the all-in from Dvoris. And Dvoris also doesn't want to play any longer with True Teller and decides to shove. 
Being near the top of his range, and with the SPR being less than 2, we see that Pio is indeed shoving with most of its kings. This move will get max value from a number of weaker hands, such as lower pairs and flush draws that should continue, and it also denies equity from hands which are behind at the moment, but could catch up on later streets, such as straight draws and ace highs. Interestingly, we see that pocket aces are again mostly calling behind here, presumably because they don't need much protection. And we see that virtually no aces containing a spade are raising, as they require less protection from flush draws due to card removal. And we can see how the SPR should be affecting Daniel's strategy by running an experiment and increasing the SPR from less than 2 to 1, as it is here, to over 5 to 1. As you can see, with a higher ceiling of chips at risk, but all other variables remaining the same, the overall strategy has been significantly altered. Pew is tending to dampen the aggression for mid to upper tier hands such as over pairs, but is increasing the aggression for top tier hands such as these sets in order to obtain max value. Whereas with the lower SPR on the left, hands like over pairs are being played faster because the total quantum of chips at risk is reduced, but the top tier hands are being checked because there are potentially two additional opportunities to get stacks in on later streets. Dvoris, snap call from Kuznetsov. Dvoris drawing the two outs. <laughs> Pot is nearly 500,000 chips. It is Dvoris' tournament life on the line here. He can rebuy, though. He can re-enter. Not sure if anyone will re-enter for the last two hands of the night or just come back tomorrow with a fresh stack. The turn is a seven. One card to come. Two outs to hit. Not a king. <laughs> and True Teller calls. With the set, this is clearly a standard call, and we see Pio calling with most top pairs and a number of second pairs as well. Additionally, in contrast to the last hand, Pio is also calling most flush draws with the improved odds. So what are the takeaways from these hands? Well, for one, I think they both show the importance of position and how we should generally be shifting our strategies towards passivity out of position and towards aggression in position. Also, we examined how an ante should generally increase our calling range preflop and how certain mid to low boards will often favor the cold caller's compressed range. And finally, we saw that our calling strategy to a shove should depend primarily on an analysis of pot odds versus equity. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching and all the comments, likes, and subscribes. Until next time, stay balanced.